From the former convent of the Good Shepherd overlooking Inwood Hill Park in New York City, welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where you meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home in what we affectionately call upstate Manhattan. I'm your host, Aaron Sims, and today we welcome photographer and educator Tom Okada. Tom is a third-generation Japanese-American born in New York City. He holds a BFA from New York Tech and an MFA in photography from Pratt Institute. He's also a New York State certified art teacher and is now a professor at St. Thomas Aquinas College, where he teaches digital and documentary photography. Throughout his career, Tom has exhibited his photographs in galleries on Cape Cod, Boston, and at the Hammond Museum in Salem, New York. Currently, Tom is working on portraits of Cape Cod artists at work. We're going to talk to him about his work, behind the camera and in the classroom and so much more. But first, let me welcome you, Tom, to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's really great to have you here. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for having me. You bet. Um, so let's start at um, your newest work, shall we? Uh, let's talk about, tell me about your latest portrait project of Cape Cod artists. Uh, can you tell our listeners what is special about this group that inspired you to document them? Well, it's, uh, it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And it's just beginning. It's, it was something that my wife and I had an idea to go into an artist colony and figure out what makes this place special. It's one of the oldest artist colony in America. And they are drawn to the light. They are drawn to the sky. They are drawn to the fact that there's, there's art appreciation. And... Uh, I was always afraid to approach the artist and say, can I do your portrait? And last summer, we just struck up a conversation with two artists and said, you know, I'd like to work on these portraits. Would you mind if I take your picture at work? And they were very inviting and said yes. And uh, took it from there. It's really great to have access, right? That's the key. Yeah. Yeah, the, the one thing that I, I realize is that what can stop an artist is oneself. Fear or, or just shyness or, or just whatever insecurity is there. There's always that little doubt in your head that says, oh, you know, don't do the that. The committee. The committee. And then there's that side of you that says, it's worth it, try, what do you have to lose? And, right. And that's the voice I listen to. Wow. And... I was surprised how inviting uh, Joe Diggs was and Bob Henry was to say, yeah, come on in. And, and, and it, it wasn't a matter of talking. It was a matter of saying, Let, let's see your work. And then they start to do some work. And Bob Henry in particular said, I haven't been painting. And, and he said, here's my, my, my palette. And it was incredible to see all his paints uh, on the palette and he, he had a, a kitchen knife and he said I paint with a knife and he started to scrape the paint and actually paint on a canvas that he put aside and he says he was grateful that I came because he had been in a slump and, and this got him started to paint and he wasn't posing for me but he was actually painting. I think we sh maybe one of the stills you provided for our video version of the podcast yes. shows that. Yes. Yeah. What a great thing to witness someone's process, right? Right, right. And, and I love painting. I'm not a painter. I learned about painting in college. And I have a, the utmost respect for painters. And, and I'm familiar with Bob Henry's work. And Joe Diggs is a new, new uh, artist to me. And his story was based in his family and his family home and how, how that affected. And that was his subject matter. So I photographed him at his home and at his uh, family house, and it was in disrepair and, and, and unable to be used. And he's very sad, and I captured a portrait of him in front of that place. And, and I didn't hear from him after I took his picture, and he said he was sorry that he didn't respond sooner, but he said, you have a way of getting to the heart of things. It took me a long time to accept or to see and and then he he said he loved the photograph that's a that's a that's a great example of and great lessons two great lessons a one um 
don't be afraid to ask uh, to to be to be part of something and pursue a project. And two is that um, you know a lesson in portraiture as well, in the sense of that you're finding um, you know the essence about people, you know, a little something about them, what you perceive in them and having that come out and right. the, the fact that he can recognize that himself has to be a huge compliment to you. Right. Yeah. It's, it's nice to know that they love the pictures of themselves. And my wife, Eva, uh, and I are working together on this project. She's interviewing them and asking them about their story. And we hope to put something together. Sounds like a book in the making. Yeah. Something like a book. That's great. That's great. And so where are you in the process now? So you just started, um, just beginning. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, well, we look forward to more about that, uh, coming up. Um, so let's venture a little bit back into your early days, if you don't mind. No, um, no. you're, uh, you cite influences of working closely under photojournalist, uh, Eugene Smith and famed environmental portrait photographer, Arnold Newman. Uh, that's an education of photography. You can't quite measure on paper. Right. Uh, how did you land those assistant jobs? Well, with Gene Smith, um, it was a matter of perseverance and luck all together at the same time. And, and, and uh, wh what happened was he just came back from Minamata and he was doing a, a lecture at ICP. And my teacher at Pratt said, you should all see this, uh, this uh, interview because uh, he, he's a master photographer, and, and I, I loved his work always. I didn't, didn't know him. I didn't know that he was even alive, and, and I was ignorant. So I went to this, this uh, interview at ICP, and I took a photograph of him at the end where he was oblivious to the applause and in tears, and I was just totally impressed by what he had to say. And... Um, at that lecture was a Japanese man who was uh, his assistant in, in, in Minamata. His name is Takeshi Ishikawa. And being a Japanese-American, I, I reached out to shake his hand, and he gave me his phone number. He says, I'm staying at Jeans right now on 23rd Street. And... Um, uh, he spoke very little English, and I spoke almost no Japanese, but we were able to communicate. <laughs> so I went back to ICP a couple of days later, and I was in the bookstore, and Gene Smith walks in, and he says, oh, I meant to call Eileen at home, and I, I can't remember my phone number. I, I, it's just a new number. We just moved in. I don't know the number. So I said, I happen to have your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And, and uh, I, I uh, gave it to him, I introduced myself. I said, I took a photograph of you. I'd love to give it to you. He says, sure. And one thing led to another. Um, I see, uh, Pratt was putting on a, a show for New York City buses, and, and we volunteered to help him put his photographs of Minamata on New York City buses. And he said, well, I don't have my darkroom set up yet, and I um, would love to part participate, but I need, I need to get this set up. And I said, I could help you do that. So that's where I took that photograph of Gene and Eileen when we were going to uh, New Paul's to unload his stuff and bring it back to 23rd Street and, you know, be there, help out, get to know them, volunteer, one thing led to another, and Ishikawa was moving back to Japan, and the opportunity was there, and I offered to uh, to help out and work for him, and, and I got the job. Again, it's yours for the asking, right? It's yours for the asking, yeah. Again, it was that, that sense of doubt was overcome by the sense of, I, should, I have to do this. And I was, I was in my final years at Pratt Institute. I, all I had to do was my thesis project. And I said, you know, I would love to photograph Gene at work at home in his loft. And I asked him if I could take his photographs and do a story about him. And I knew so little about photography at that point. And, and 
he was so gracious and he said yes. And for him, it was like the, doing a story about the guy who did the stories. So, a peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Peek behind the curtains. And it took me a long time to get a real photograph because what I discovered is that he was my hero. And I wanted him, I elevated him into hero status. And the photographs I took of him at the beginning illustrated that awe and respect. But he was also a human being who had problems and, 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 I couldn't recognize that in my photographs. Once, once I got over that and accepted him for who he was, the photographs started to come out where he was being real and being himself. And he was always being himself. It was, I was choosing to photograph that part of him. Right. Now, during that time when I was working for Gene, Arnold Newman came to do a portrait of Gene Smith and and he said to me, Arnold said to me, I hear, uh, uh, you know, Gene is moving to Arizona in a couple in a couple of months. Are you going going with him? I said, No, I'm going to stay in New York. He says, Well, if 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 uh, if you want, you can work with me because my assistant is leaving. So, I uh, the job was still there when Gene left, and I called Arnold, and he said, Yeah, come on in for an interview and, and uh, I showed him my portraits of Gene. He said, do you bring any photographs you know, to show my work? And he looks at my photographs of Gene and he says, well, you, know, you gotta realize Arnold is like a master portrait photographer and he's got a major, major ego. I didn't know that at the time. But he says, quite frankly, I like your photographs of Gene more than my own. Wow. And I said, wow, thank you very much. I said, well, I had three years, you had three hours. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a handicap, but hey. And he, he appreciated the, the, you know, the context, and, and he said, well, can you spot photographs? I said, sure, and he gave me a spotting test, and he said, you got the job. And uh, I learned so much from both of them. Like you said, it's, it's something that even if you paid for a school, you, you can't get that kind of education. Right. Well, um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, they both had different careers, but worked a lot in black and white. Um, uh, what about their work appealed to you that perhaps influenced your still life work in black and white? Because you do work in black and white quite a bit. Yes. I think... Um, content wise it, it they get to the heart of the matter they get to the the meaning behind the photograph and and really hit you in the heart and that's that's with people and that's with uh news not news but documentary photography or portraits interpreting that into still life is is a whole different thing but with a common denominator is lighting and what I learned from and printing what I learned from both of them cumulatively is how to light and how to print and how to get from seeing something in the mind's eye to interpreting it photographically and capturing it on film and then on paper great lessons great lessons great lessons um, I like to turn the subject to putting together a portfolio and selecting images, talk about spotting things and things like that. Uh, you've had great mentors, but you're also a teacher and a mentor. Yes. Um, so I'd like for those listening who are interested in photography to hear your friendly advice on approaching what you consider and selecting examples to be representative of a composition of someone's work. Teaching photography on the high school level for 12 years was a challenge. Um, it, it, for one thing, you, you have 18 to 25 students in a class, all coming at different levels of, of understanding and a absolutely no experience with photography and not knowing what they're getting into and realizing that it's a lot of hard work. And my classes were both black and white film and darkroom photography combined with 
digital photography. So it was a double curriculum. And students are used to, it, to immediate gratification with digital photography. They take a camera, the phone, and they point and shoot. And they get the result right there. They don't see a printout, but they, they see it on their phone. I had to teach them how to take that photograph and put it into Photoshop and operate Photoshop and program the software program and to enhance the photograph and to do something with that. As well as black and white photography, they had to use a manual black and white film camera and a light meter and take the photographs one at a time and after they shoot a roll of 20 exposures, they had to learn how to develop it in a roll the film up in a dark bag and develop the film and see the result and sometimes it was disappointing because nothing came out or they made a mistake or sometimes the miracle of seeing images on film after working for a week and a half on shooting it and learning how to process it, it, it there's nothing more exciting than that and uh, composition comes uh, later on, first it's technique, and I used to tell them that I'm like Mr. Miyagi in the Karate Kid, where it's wax on, wax off, wax yeah. on, wax off. It's a matter of repetition, yeah. and and learning the skills, and then the assignments I gave them were were designed to challenge their their eye, so that they would they would start to compose pictures with something specific in mind, gave them a framework. And for instance, one of the assignments that I gave was photographing the invisible. And they say, what are you talking about invisible? How am I going to possibly do that? I say, well, what is invisible in, in this world that, that is actually there? And one of the things that I bring up to them is wind. Wind can be destructive, it could be productive, it could be a windmill, it could cause erosion, it can cause big waves and flooding, it could knock down a, a building, it could, it could be harnessed into energy. But the work of the wind is visible and it leaves its evidence behind and that's what you have to look for. So sometimes the, the idea of photographing something that they have to look for and understand that it's it's there even though it's it's not visible um, helps them to frame their photographs and and you get so many different results I, I can imagine it has to be a great feeling to see them yeah. attempting to explore their own interests and discover uh, what fuels and drives them and um, and perhaps that discovery drives them in new directions to pursue who knows, maybe even more, just, just an interest in photography, let alone a career. It's, right. that, that has to be rewarding to you to see them you know, make these discoveries. Yeah, sometimes it's amazing what it opens up with other mediums, like some, some people were writers and, and they would write about their photograph. And the writing was more important than the photograph in, in many ways and mm. it discovered a new avenue of creativity for them. Well, as a teacher, that must make you feel pretty good. Yes, it does. Um, well, as, uh, as someone who owns his own studio in New York City, but also has a lot of commercial experience, um, talking about, you know, not just teaching, but also those, you know, having the professional time, um, what advice can you give those young photographers and perhaps those established out there who are trying to get their products noticed? I think the, the hardest part about being a commercial photographer was that you could put your heart and soul into an image and your client may not like it, and you'd have to redo it. And I worked in, I worked in a uh, photo studio for Avon Products, Filene's, and my own studio, and, and Virtus. So I've had, I don't know, 30 years in the studio where everything is possible, and, and if you, if you, set up your lights and the art director says can you move this over a half an inch to the right and can you remove this and put this in instead 
you, you, you can't fight them. They're your clients. You could discuss it with them, but you can't, you don't own it. You're being paid to do a job and you have to figure a way to make the change. And in the commercial world, time is money. So you have to light it in such a way that if they say, can you reduce the highlight and not affect the, the color of the product um, and the form that you've created with your main light, then you have to be able to make those changes in your lighting without having to relight the whole thing and refigure out everything because that could take hours. So within minutes you have to make the changes, satisfy what, they, what they're looking for, interpret what they're looking for, and, and show them the result. And if they like it, then move on to the next shot. So. I think the advice that I want to give to anyone who wants to be a photographer is, is to learn the technique and to learn how to let go and to use your technique and ability to let go to just make an improvement and not get hung up with the anger of fr and frustration that can happen with a redo. Well, that's, a, that's, that's great. And, and also, you know, breaking it down the sense of that you unpack a little thing you said there, like you're an instrument, you're a work for hire in many ways of achieving a product uh, as a commercial photographer in many ways. And, and they're, they're paying you for a service and respect, unlike your own work, which you're, you know, developing from the inside out for the most part. Exactly. And, and I had a, as a manager, I had a photographer who was getting confused and angry with me and saying, you're just trying to impose your way over my way. And, and I said, no, it's, it's, um, it's not my way over your way. It's a matter that your way could be a lot better than you're doing right now. And, and the, the best advice I have to anyone who is upset with an art director or a manager or a studio manager saying that it, it has to be redone is to do your art because no one can tell you what to do with your art except yourself. They could advise you, they could, they could maybe even criticize you, but they can't tell you what to do because it's your artwork. So if you separate your artwork from your commercial work, then there's a space that you have that no one can touch. Whereas if all your creative energy is in the commercial field, then you become more possessive of it because it's your creation. It's your baby. It's, it's, I don't want you to tell me what to do, but that's your own conflict. You have to have a space where that it can't be touched. Right. Well, tying together a few things we talked about, um, you just mentioned, uh, we talked earlier about, um, you know, the process of, and the reward of digital, of, uh, of, um, you know, uh, doing, doing the, um, the darkroom photography. And, uh, then there's the, you know, having the technical skills to work with the new digital photography. Um, and also talking about, um, you know, working uh, your time at Filene's, which I believe was up in Boston and, uh, was the first digital commercial studio in the country at the time. Um, wasn't that right? Yes. Uh, so what are your thoughts on, uh, on digital photography as a tool versus hand printed darkroom prints? I think that uh, the disadvantage of digital photography in relation to art is that it can make anything look so much better, almost without just by pointing and shooting. And I think that you could lose a sense of lighting as a result of the importance of lighting and controlling lighting. Um, with black and white photography, if you don't have the lighting there, then it, it's not going to be as beautiful as it can be. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just point and shoot and, and get the same result. The digital camera, especially these days, can forgive you a lot of errors in lighting and highlights and shadows. You can fix it in post-production. Um, I think when when digital photography first came out at, at Filene's, uh, the lighting was crude. It was it was uh, 
I think they're called HMI lights. They were arc lights. They were thousand watt light bulbs that were made out of two carbon arcs touching and, and the gap was the, the, the light. It was like what they had in, in, in the movies when they shine a light through the window. Uh, and lipstick would melt, perfume would expand <laughs> and pop. You couldn't shoot certain things. Um, you had to wear sunglasses. It was so crude. Wow. And we were expected to match strobe lighting or tungsten lighting, and it was, it, was, it was almost impossible. But they quickly replaced the software and allowed us to use tungsten light, which, which was different from strobe lighting, but much more fine. And you were able to control your still life work uh, with, with nice lighting and long exposures. Well, that's a great answer and, uh, and also a great history lesson as well uh, to help, um, you know, figure out, you know, and also, also there's also a degree of patience for developing photography, uh, black and white in the dark room versus the immediacy <laughs> yeah. of the digital world. Well, the problem that we encountered was that the clients, the, the buyers and the, uh, the people in charge of the advertising department would see that a, dig, a, a film product took a, an hour to develop a sheet of film. So you had to incorporate an hours of time just for film to process. Whereas digital was instantaneous. So they said, oh, we don't have to give you your layouts and make up our minds on certain decisions on the products to put in the photograph until later because you can save all that time in 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 film processing so they they gave us things later they gave us things backed up and the time saving was lost because everything was right misconceived that you have more time available yeah. to do it lack of economy in many ways lack of economy yeah yeah well for your new project cape cod are you doing black and whites or are you going to are you going to be doing uh i digital? started i started off with digital okay and uh I, I will probably continue that way. Great. But I have some black and white projects and that are, are different, different subjects that I, that I want to work on, such as uh, I'm, I'm going to start working on landscape photography in, in Inwood Hill Park with my 4x5 view camera. So I want to get involved with doing some trees and, and woods and rocks more meditative and using daylight and developing the film sheet film in the dark room one of four sheets at a time so that's that's a whole different process yeah, i smell a gallery presentation in your future tom yeah that sounds great i hope so oh man that sounds great well tom um it's been a pleasure speaking with you thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to uh be a guest on the thank you very Center. much i appreciate it it's nice talking to you too you bet. So uh, before we say goodbye, though, where can we send people to find out more about your photography? Tomokada.com. T-O-M-O-K-A-D-A.com. That's my website. Listeners, you have your marching instructions. <laughs> Go check it out, and you can see a lot of uh, the photos and uh, um, uh, collections that Tom just spoke about during the podcast. Um, so thanks again to Tom for joining me on this Artist Spotlight episode of In What Artworks On Air. It's where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. If you have a home, uh, sorry, if you have a moment, uh, please show some love right now here in our home by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. Many thanks to Church of Good Shepherd here in Inwood, New York City for hosting us and to Hidesites.com for Uptown promotional support. Uh, you can support On Air and all of our programming by making a tax-free donation at inwoodartworks.nyc backslash donate. Be sure to follow us on our social media channels at Inwood Artworks to keep up with all that we do, which includes the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, pop-up art galleries, live performances, and so much more. Inwood Artworks is really proud to be supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Aaron Sims for Inwood Artworks On Air. <laughs>